Hey, everybody out there, you're tuned in to 91.8 The Fan. I have a very special guest with me today. Would you like to introduce yourself to everybody, reveal your hidden identity? My hidden identity um, is Keith Sparabica. Uh, that's also my unhidden identity. <laughs> well, that's that's good. That way we know exactly who you are. Are we still there? Did <laughs> Did I break the contact right? No, I don't think we've broken anything. I just think we have a, a small <laughs> little bit of <laughs> lag did? between oh. us. <laughs> Depends on internet speeds. Not much okay. you can do about it. But let's uh, start with the very basics because I obviously know that you went to uh, school uh, for, for acting. But can you tell us, you know, what what got you really interested in it? Like when you were a little kid in diapers? <laughs> Uh, my my mother actually put me when I was like three years old. She put me into into a um, a, a community talent show, and I had to sing. I've been working on the railroad with my cousin Joyce, uh, and I think that's what did it to me. I was I was I was ruined ever afterwards. <laughs> uh, and then uh, <clears throat> oddly enough, I went to a military school where we didn't do plays, but uh, but we did per, you know march and perform and have to conduct you know drills and stuff in, in front of large audiences and uh, and I was part of a like a crack drill team that you know had to throw our rifles up in the air and things like that so I think I got a little I got bit by the show business bug doing that actually odd, odd as it may seem and afterwards you just naturally went to school for it and found your well, place I, or was there I more to started, it I didn't really go to school for it I started uh, acting a lot in in high school when I was they wouldn't let me play football. I, I had at the school I was at. You had to be 115 pounds, and I was a, literally a 98 pound weakling. And um, so I ended up uh, playing in intramural sports, you know, which are just against you know your classmates. And um, and I was kind of disappointed. And I ended up uh, trying out for a play, and uh, I got cast as Grandma in Edward Albee's The Sandbox. I went to a, a Catholic uh, boys. Uh, Jesuit boarding school in Wisconsin, and uh, we had all all boys, and I, but I, I played a female role, and uh, <laughs> I was grandma in the sandbox, and I was a, an instantaneous success. People uh, really liked me in it, and um, while I didn't stay at that school very long, I, I ended up leaving and going to a public school back in uh, the northwest suburbs of Chicago to John Hersey High School, and I... Um, <laughs> I, I actually was was kind of struggling in school, and I, I didn't like going to school very much. Um, and I ended up uh, cutting this French class so often that they were going to suspend me. Oh and no! I I, uh, I actually they did suspend me for one day, and I I fielded the phone call from the dean of students and pretended I was my father, and 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 I really got through that one, and I actually succeeded. Uh, Although both my dad and the dean of students later in life said, oh, we knew all about that. <laughs> uh, but as a result of that suspension, I ended up, uh, they said, well, you know, you obviously aren't enjoying this French class. What, what would you like to do? And I said, I don't know what classes are there available for me. And uh, it turned out there was a drama class. Um, and I was a junior in high school. And, and I, I was new to this school and I hardly knew anybody. And I was, you know, kind of lonely and kind of getting in trouble. And ended up falling in with the uh, drama uh, class crowd because there were girls there. You have to understand, I'd gone to a military boarding school for boys for nine years. And I never went to class with girls. Girls were something that existed outside of my parameters other than my mother and my sisters and my cousins. So um, this was the first chance I got to really um, interact in, in, a, in a real way with, uh, with, with, with females of my own age. And uh, so I, I fell in love with it, and uh, they, I guess, fell in love with me. And from then on, I uh, that year I, I actually got cast in a, in a production of A Thousand Clowns, um, and I played Mary Burns, the lead role, and it was supposed to have been the senior play, but as a junior I got cast because I don't know why. I guess I was good, and I ended up winning the uh, the Best Actor award that Ooh, year. Ooh, congratulations! Thank you. I haven't won many awards since then, but I bo I won the Best Actor award in my in, in both my junior and my senior year in high school, and the Senior Dramatics uh, Award, which actually led me to feel that I might actually be talented. I'm not sure why that. I've been dissuaded of that l later in life, but. Um, uh, and I ended up with a theater scholarship to the school, Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, where I went for six months and uh, took the best class I've ever taken, 
uh, it was run by a man named uh, Paul Baker, who ran the Dallas Theater Center. I believe uh, Mr. Baker is dead now. But he had this great class called Integration of Abilities, in which we were, uh, we had to do over, over three week periods of different three week periods of time, we had to do sculpture, music, writing, uh, movement, uh, painting. It was, it was just how to get you in, in touch with, with that, the creative impulse. And it's a, a class for which I've uh, felt blessed ever since for having taken. And, um, and then that, that summer I was home and um, I was uh, working at a job uh, that I'd had uh, both after my junior year and my senior year working, doing materials analysis, going down and uh, I was working on a drill crew and doing uh, for construction, you know, and we would uh, do test samplings and stuff of, uh, of different sites so the, to see whether they were, you know, what they would have to do to actually build something there. And I had, I went to see a production of um, Death of a Salesman with Jack Warden um, at Arlington Park Theater in, uh, out in Arlington Heights where I, uh, where my parents lived at the time. And I went with my sister and, and a good friend of mine and we, uh, I was so moved by this performance that I didn't want to end up like Biff that I actually got out I dropped my sister and my buddy off. I drove downtown to to, to Lincoln Avenue to the Organic Theater uh, Company, which was at the Body Politic on North Lincoln Avenue at the time, and where I'd seen a, pl uh, a play the year before uh, while I was still in high school called Poe that had been the most astonishing thing I'd ever seen in my life. And uh, and I said, boy, if I ever work with anybody, I'm going to work with them. So I drove down there. It was 9.30 at night. I get there, I'm in front, and the, the play's just letting out. And I suddenly, I woke up like I was out of a dream, and I go, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? <laughs> and I started leaning against the light pole and banging my head against the light pole like I've got, I finally have lost my mind 100% completely. And suddenly I feel this tap on my shoulder, and I turn around, and this smallish man, you know, uh, looks at me and goes, um, can I help you? Are you okay? And I go, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Uh, he goes, are you looking for somebody? Waiting for somebody? He says, uh, you know, I'm in the cast here. He says, are you looking? And I go, yeah, I'm looking for somebody. And he goes, well, who are you looking for? And um, uh, he mentioned Stuart Gordon's name, who is the, he's, he's a director, and he was the artistic director of the theater at the time and was directing this this play uh, that they were doing. And I and I went, no, I don't know him. And he goes, Lenny Kleinfeld, who had written it. I go, no, I don't know him. He goes, Zazu Pitts. I go, I have someone. Take me in to see her. So he goes, <laughs> okay. So brings me into this brightly colored sort of ante room uh, that was uh, backstage, which was covered with, it was called the rug room because it was covered with brightly colored pieces of rugs. It was, it was 1972. So you have to understand it was still kind of the hippie era. And, um, and he goes, look, I got to tell you, Zazu Pitts is in here. And I go, I, I figured that. I'm not really that crazy. And he goes, well, he says, my name is Bill Norris. What's yours? Uh, I said, Keith Sarabike. And he goes, I'll just call you Keith if you don't mind. I go, I said, that's fine. He says, really, why are you here? I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm home from, from college for the, for, for the summer. And uh, I just really wanted to get, you know, I've done acting. And, uh, and uh, I, I wanted to just do something, you know, involved with the theater and get back, get involved. And he goes, really? He goes, you've acted? He goes, I go, yes. He goes, where? I go, well, uh, you know, some college and, you know, in community theater and a lot in high school. And he goes, really? He goes, do you know what play we're doing now? And I go, um, uh, I'm not sure. He goes, it's called Warp. And, and it's, and oh, I know some friends of mine saw it. And there was this little guy who looked like Woody Allen. And he was like, you <laughs> saving the universe and, 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 and smashing, you know, giants and monsters. And they said it was really cool. I said, and I saw this production poll last year, which I thought was unbelievably good, you know. And he goes, really, you saw that? I go, he says, he says I was in that. I go, well, yeah, I recognize you now, you know. And, and, and then he goes, he says, do you, you act. You, I have someone I want you to meet. And I go, I go, okay. And I was in pretty buff shape then. I was like, I had long blonde hair and I was running four miles a day and swimming two miles a day in addition to whatever it was else I was doing. And I was, I was tan because I was working in construction. So I looked pretty good. And he goes and he goes and knocks on the door and the door, the door to the, uh, uh, the green room opens up from the, from the, uh, the, the, the carpet, the, the rug room. And, uh, and this big cloud of of pot smoke comes out basically. Oh God. <laughs> and I look back and, and this guy who looks like Jerry Garcia with his big 
wiry black hair and beard and little tiny glasses looks he looks at he looks at, at, at Bill Norris and he looks at me and he goes like Norris why are you bringing your tricks backstage you know and uh, and and he goes uh, uh, Stuart Gordon this is uh, Keith I can't pronounce his last name Keith wants to audition for the role of Lord Cumulus in Warp oh and, wow and 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 I and I'm like stunned he goes and Stuart looks at me and goes fire out come back on Tuesday with a prepared Shakespearean reading oh and uh, make it something militant. And then he closes the door, and then Bill looks to me. He goes, "It's all yours, Bubbala." <laughs> I go, "Okay." And I, I was stricken. I got, I had no idea this. And it turned out that this is like the lead role of this play. And John Hurd, who was playing it, was unhappy and wanted to leave. You know, uh, the actor John Hurd, who's actually one of my best friends now, almost forty years later. And um, and it, it turns out, you know, I came in there and I. Uh, I, I, I called my high school drama teacher. I go, well, what should I, what should I do? I mean, what, he goes, oh, I know that theater company. Uh, uh, do uh, do uh, Pandarus' speech from the end of Troilus and Cressida. And it's all about bequeathing. He, Pandarus is a, is a, he's a pander, he's a pimp. And he has syphilis and he reveals it at the end of the play, you know, and, and bequeathing his diseases. And it's, he's like an older character. So I did that one. And, and they looked at me and they went, come back tomorrow night with something else, okay? And I go... Okay, um, so I go. I'm not calling him. So what am I going to do? I'll do Hamlet's "To Be or Not to Be" soliloquy. So I, I'm sitting there madly, you know, trying to to be or not to be. That is, oh, jeez, I can't get it. Um, <laughs> so I, I I finally get there and I'm like really nervous. And it's I hadn't seen the show before. I just did audition. They brought me back and there was this other guy who was like really tall and handsome and very Shakespearean looking, you know, and and you know had all the moves and. And I'm and, and I'm sitting there kind of talking to him and he's like, Oh, I've studied at Rod and done this. And he, where have you and I go, um, in high school and college a little bit because I uh -oh. semester. And then he goes, Oh, well, yes. And uh and and then uh, Stuart comes on and goes, So uh what are you gonna be doing for us? And I go, um, I'm going to do, uh, and this guy says something from King John, and I say, Oh, I'm gonna do how much to be or not to be soliloquy. And he goes, I can't wait to see this. You know, I guess I'd impressed him, uh, <laughs> maybe in the wrong way. But anyway, uh, I go and I in and watch the show, and I couldn't believe the show. The show was like um, Star Wars on stage, but better. It was people doing backflips all over and rock music, and it was really funny, and the fights were incredibly intense, and the audiences, it was just packed. It was a small theater, but it was just packed. And so I'm, like, desperately afraid. I'm, I'm having, like, the worst. I'm, like, going, I got to run out of here. And the, the, the play ends, and I'm just, you know, I'm going, oh, my God, I can't do this. And uh, so the, they clear the theater out, and they bring me and this other guy, and I sit off stage and watch this guy do this beautiful King John speeches and moving and everything's just like, wow. And I'm going, oh, geez. And I'm going, I'm not going to do that. I just, I can't. I'm not going to do it. And and they get up there, and I go, uh, well, so, Keith, let's, let's see. Let's hear Hamlet's soliloquy. And I go. I'm not going to do that. I'm going. I I won the best actor award my second year for for doing in high school and my senior year for winning uh, for playing um, a Thomas uh, More in A Man for All Seasons. And so I um, I said I did a speech of that. And I go. Uh, it starts out uh, to avoid this. I have taken every path my winding wits would find. And now that the court is determined to condemn me, God knows how. And it goes on from there. But I start going. They said, well, could you do it as Lord Cumulus first, who's like the good guy, and then Prince Chaos is the bad guy. And they want you, we want you to do this Prince Chaos later. And I go, okay. And I start to avoid this winding. Oh, nuts. I can't remember the line. Um, can I start again? So I, and it was like some some being overtook me. And I did this, I don't even know what I did. But they like all the at the end of the speech, they all look, it was like they look like the audience in springtime for Hitler, where their eyes are wide open. <laughs> uh, completely brushed back you know and they go far out um do the uh do the prince chaos thing now and i go okay and i did to avoid this with oh that's a kidding ah, i gotta start again so i start going and i go again and do the whole thing and uh, sa same thing happens it's like something took me over you know um and then they say okay act like you're being crushed by a giant hand and take your shirt off you know everybody did that I go, I leave, I figure I've completely and utterly embarrassed myself. Five days later, I get a call from Stuart Gordon saying, uh, uh, we want to hire, we've had a company meeting, we want to hire you for the company. Now, John may not leave, but 
in th- which case we want you to be in the company though. And I go, okay. And I ended up, I ended up doing the, let me put it this way. I ended up doing the part for three, three months in Chicago. And I actually did more performances on Broadway than John did because the play went from, from the off, off loop theater that it was in to, to, to Broadway, uh, the, the next February and, and crashed and burned. Clive Barnes, who was the New York times, uh, film critic at the time said it was beautiful junk and you should go in high spirits if not actually high, but it was a comic book on stage. Anyway, sorry for the long, but that, but that's, you asked how I became an actor and that's how I became an actor. Not at all. I love long stories. And Be I, careful what you ask. <laughs> you might get it. I thought it was very interesting. And I, I have to say, it's uh, congratulations for, you know, ha- having that sort of doubt and nervousness. Oh, I'm not going to get in. And then suddenly, you've got it. And uh, I, I think that's always uh, sort of a happy I ending. I always just assume no one's ever going to hire me. That's my constant assumption when I do anything. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's a good protection, though, just in case. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it is. Now, I'm, I'm sort of curious because obviously now you do uh, video game work and, and more voiceovers and whatnot. And I'm, I'm curious how you got into that from theater to voiceover. Um, well, it, it, it's kind of a natural progression. I mean, you know, theater, it, you're, you're reading something that you have memorized, whereas in most video games, you're reading something straight off the page. Uh, although sometimes when you, when you have to do um, uh, mocap, sort of stuff uh like for dead that i did for dead space and uh, a version of mocap which is called facial uh uh capture um uh for uh la noir you were just reading it and so what happened is that i i did a lot of theater when i was in new york and i was asked by um uh, one of my neighbors, it turned out, who ran Symphony Space in New York, uh, he, and they had this program called Selected Shorts in which they had uh, actors, you know, some famous, some not, uh, but all of them that they liked, uh, read short stories in front of live audiences uh, at Symphony Space in New York. And that's how I kind of got into doing uh, the voiceover work because, excuse me, it turns out that a lot of advertising people you know, they not only see you in plays, they actually go to plays in New York. Uh, they, they, a lot of them went to to the selected shorts thing. And I couldn't believe it the first time I was supposed to do it. I go, it was like February 1986 or 87. And um, and it was a real cold, rainy February. And I my I was three blocks, I lived three blocks from in New York from um, selected shorts uh, from Symphony Space. And um, I walked over there and I had to do a sound check. And I go, oh, it's going to be nothing. Nobody's going to be there. And nobody was there, you know. And so I did the sound check. And then I went back home, ate dinner, and came back at, at 7 o'clock. And it, people were literally hanging from the rafters in this, in this theater. It was amazing. And the energy was so amazing. And it was, again, it was one of those incredible, almost out-of-body experiences, you know, that I had. And it was all, it's all taped for radio, and then they play it later on, uh, on, 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 uh, on NPR. Uh, and actually, there are no stations that, that play it in L.A., uh, but it's on WNYC in New York. And uh, it used to be on uh, KCRW and uh, KPCC uh, in L.A., but it's not on either of them anymore. Even though they st- we do, I still do them, we, uh, we record them at the, at the Getty now in L.A. Uh, when they're here. Now, I always hear that theater actually helps with uh, voiceover because y- you have more, you can grasp more of your imagination in theater. You know, you don't have to be as realistic as, say, like a TV yeah. drama. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. What, what What do you mean by realistic? You know, I mean, uh, TV was, was, was Daniel Holtz an angel realistic i mean he was that's true i, I was playing you know an 18th century english vampire hunter who came to the 21st century to kill angel you know <laughs> so you gotta go okay is that realistic but and and and, the, and and my acting in that i i would say was 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 reasonably theatrical you know uh, i felt sort of pseudo shakespearean in it which was fun uh and i and i think you know a lot of, like the star uh like the Star Trek things that I did, they're, they're, they, they were, I was playing alien characters. Um, I mean, yeah, you know, like in Cold Case uh, and in The Equalizer, I was playing a real human, but um, I don't know, were they real? Really? I mean, was Mickey Kosmeyer real? I don't know. Well, you know, I, I understand from that yes, perspective. I, I, I was the, you know, I, I, I was never a Navy SEAL. 
I was I was I was never a Navy SEAL, but I played one on TV, and I I, I learned to use all the different guns. I actually uh, took up parachuting while I was doing them, and I learned to scuba dive. So I guess that I could maybe someday, if I if, if I could have been a, a Navy SEAL, although I don't think I'm nearly tough enough to be honest with you. <laughs> Flex those muscles. I'm sure you, I'm sure everybody can see them. <laughs> <laughs> But I think we'll take a very short break here on 91.8 The Fan, so don't go anywhere because you're tuned in to your favorite station where we play everything you want and nothing you don't. This is a public service announcement. It has recently come to our attention that not wearing shirts causes Sassnat cancer, double herpes, and super diabetes. To prevent these made-up illnesses, 918 The Fan is distributing protective clothing specifically designed to protect you from hazardous materials through a patented process that we won't explain because you'll probably just be too stupid to understand this totally not fake or made-up science. To get your protective garment, simply head over to 918thefan.com and click on the apparel button under store. Remember, only 918 The Fan's protective shirts are 100% effective in protecting you from the radiation given off by death crystals and dysentery lasers. Don't settle for cheap imitations. It could cost you your life. Hey, everybody out there. You're tuned in to 91.8 The Fan. My special guest is still here. Would you like to give us a sign of life? Hello. I'm, I'm still breathing. That's always a good thing. I like when they're still breathing. <laughs> I, I, I haven't talked myself you know, out of my existence yet. Although close, probably. <laughs> well, and you get your coffee, too, to help perk you up. Yes. <laughs> Black coffee. And now, see, I I have water. I'm boring, so. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I I have my I, I have my co- I like my coffee like I like my souls black. <laughs> oh yay! <laughs> but I'm kind of curious because we left off on voiceover before the break. If we could talk a little bit about um, motion capture and a project you that that's gotten a lot of uh, fans lately, La Noir. Could you explain to us, you know, how you were approached to that? How you were approached? at that. Wow, I can't talk today. Go me. <laughs> <laughs> How you approach that and if it was difficult to, you know, do well, motion capture with voices? Uh, it, it, it was a little bit different in that I didn't actually do the, the motion capture, but I did the, what they call facial contouring, which is the, the, the voice part. But, and it's also, it's motion capture, but only from the neck up. And so it, it's actually a, a very involved process and they have a, uh, uh, a technology that's you know all their own that that they uh, that they don't allow out you know and I, I know that they've been they're they're trying to market it to different people but you don't have they don't use any dots like in in, in normal uh, motion capture which I've done before they, you're you're dotted all over your body and your different muscle groups uh, like in your face on your lips your eyelids even everywhere you have little uh, iridescent dots which uh, the motion capture infrared cameras pick up. In the studio, and you're surrounded by by banks of them in a, in a black studio. Well, in uh, they did that motion capture, but they did it with other actors earlier on, and then they they hired me to do the face and and voice of Herschel Biggs. Why they didn't have me do the motion capture earlier, I have no idea, because I would have been happy to do it, um, but they didn't. And uh, but what you see is you see me on someone else's body, my face my lips on someone else's body. And what they love about this new facial contouring is that um, they can actually catch your, your lips, your tongue, your teeth, because they said that's the hardest thing to animate correctly and to get, and to get right. And, and they can catch that, and they're very happy with it in, the, in, 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 in uh, L.A. Noire. Um, and I think Brendan McNamara is the uh, guy who, uh, from uh, Team Bondi in Australia who both wrote most of L.A. Noir and, and directed most of it, uh, at least for the sequences that I was in. Um, he was just the nicest guy, and he was really fun to work with. But he came up with this technology, and you're in a, a white, an all-white room. You're sitting on, like, a barber's chair, because it's, it's so you're comfortable. And uh, you have an orange cloth draped around you, an orange T-shirt, um, and, all, and your hair, which they've taken an hour and a half to get right, because uh, the, I guess the cameras go crazy if there's if there's any stray hairs and they, and they, they fritz out. So they, they spend an hour and a half basically plastering your hair down and filling it in so that there's no spaces anywhere. Um, and then you sit in the chair and you basically the longer speeches you have to have memorized, but you can see it you know off, uh, there's a monitor in the distance, but they don't want you to read off the monitor because they want you to look at different spaces or different places like your, 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 your character would be looking, you know, and it's very much like movie acting, only you're sitting in a chair. 
Um, and it was actually fun to do. I mean, you, yeah, but I mean, we would do sometimes 70 and 80 pages in a day worth of material. So it was, it was a lot. That sounds but, really interesting. I've never heard of that technology before. And, and sadly, there won't be any more ball jokes, but at the same time, <laughs> at least, uh, at least it looks like it's improving. Bald jokes? Ball jokes. What, and what, what, I don't know what the ball joke is. In no, it was just uh, I have a lot of voice actors who come on who, who uh, talk about motion capture and then they have a lot of really sort of immature ball jokes. Oh, yeah. Well, you mean in terms of their little balls? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so, you're, so we're getting rid of that, but it looks like the technology has improved. I don't know if you what you've seen of the game graphically, but everybody. I, I mean, I've seen trailers of it and I, I saw pieces of the game when we were shooting it and I, I thought it looked pretty cool <laughs> the driving sequences are, are, are difficult to deal with because you just run people over constantly i think <laughs> well maybe they can dodge out of the way a little bit maybe maybe, maybe. <laughs> could you tell us a little bit about your character in the game uh herschel biggs is a he's a he's an ex-marine uh he's uh he's pretty tough he's he's an older cop and he's kind of seen everything and uh, at first he doesn't like Phelps, Cole Phelps, at all, because he thinks he's a hot shot. But he actually comes to be um, uh, rather fond of him as as it, as it, as the uh, the sequence. Of, I'm in the arson sequence, and I think I actually narrate it because uh, we recorded a lot of narration. And I can't as, I, I can't think that they wouldn't have actually used all the stuff that they did. But you never know. And uh, I'm looking forward to the game myself. I haven't played it yet. Um, I'm looking forward to my kids playing it so I can sit behind them and see what they actually do because I'm terrible at playing these games, I have to admit. It's a terrible thing to say. I get in there and I was trying to play Halo 2 with my kids a couple years ago and I was dead before I could figure out what I was looking at. Well, that's hard. I, I always think that shooters, personally, are, are really hard if you're trying to get someone who isn't used to games into gaming because it's so competitive. It's very competitive, and you're dead. It's like by the time I could figure out wh which one, which was my viewpoint, and what I was looking at, and how I could make it move, I was dead. You know, because my children have no mercy. No. <laughs> well, that could be a slight problem if they kill you before you figure out which button to click. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and now, are there any other you know games or projects out there that you are able to talk about, or that's come out recently well, I, that you'd I, like I have to? Well, I voice in uh, in Transformers Three and the new you know Dark Side of the Moon. Ooh. Play uh, Laserbeak, who's a little Decepticon assassin, and you know, frankly, I should have been paid more for because he's actually a pretty good part. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, I didn't realize it was that big a part. I mean, he's not the star, but you notice him, believe me, and you see him throughout the movie. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it or, or not yet. I haven't gotten a chance to. I still need to see the second one, so shame on me. <laughs> shame on you. Well, I see. I, I have boys, so I've gone to see them all, and believe me, it hits right in the demographic. 12 to 16-year-old boys, that's, and they all loved it. Uh, my, my youngest son's uh, uh, tournament baseball team went there, and, uh, and they were just crazy about it. I'm, I've become sort of, you know, uh, I've got new status with them, let me put it that way. <laughs> so, uh, not to be too personal, so your kids, you know, do they try and, uh, you know, notice you in the movies that you're in, or, or do they get excited when they, they hear you? Um, I don't know. Why don't, Caleb, come here a second. <laughs> second Caleb, guest. Come here a second. Ta you're on the radio. Can't use bad words. <laughs> okay, come on. To. Try not to. This is my 12, soon to be 13 year old son. Ask him whether this is Jackie. She, we're on Hi. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I was just curious, you know, when you hear your dad in the movies, do you get excited? Yeah, it's kind of cool, but it's weird. Like, he, you can't really take his character seriously. And it's like, oh my God, it's my dad. <laughs> do, you, do your friends ever, ever notice him in the movies, or do you tell him? Maybe do you brag at all? I guess I do brag a little bit. Um, he doesn't want to admit that he brags about me, though. <laughs> Just like I won't admit that I brag about him. I wouldn't brag about my mom either. At least that's that's what she thinks. <laughs> um, but well, my usually I know what my dad's in, but sometimes my friends will come up to me, "Hey, did you is your dad in blah blah blah?" And I'll be like, "I don't know." And I ask him, he's like, "Oh yeah, I did a part for that." And and you know, it's kind of cool to see how many things he's done. It's really cool hearing his voice. I think that's really neat. And are you interested in acting at all, or will you pursue something else? <laughs> You're a little bit young to know, but. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, He's actually really good. He has a little, he has a, he has the it factor. Oh, really? Yes. Must be very popular with the girls. It was the production of, uh, at the Agora Children's Theater of, it was the Agora Children's Theater and the Holy Grail. It was Monty Python and the Holy Grail, uh, kind of adapted for children. And he played these small parts. And I swear to God, maybe it's because he was my son, but he just lit up the stage when he was on it, when he was there. And he was very funny, too. So I hope to God he's not an actor, but I think he may be. <laughs> well, best of luck to him in the future. <laughs> Thank you. And now I'm I'm sort of curious. Is there anything else you'd like to tell the listeners out there? Um, no, other than I'm glad you're out there. Yes, they're out there and listening, and and they love you. <laughs> yeah. The is love there, has returned. Is there any place that they can um, safely, I, I I put quotation marks on safely, stalk you on the internet? Uh, yeah. I mean, you can go on Facebook or. Uh, you can go to uh, www.darktail.tv. Um, that's my website. My last name, Sarah Bica, means dark fairy tale in Polish. Well, I'm, I'm very glad I haven't haven't messed it up or had to say it yet. So <laughs> I was I was afraid of that part. Well, now I've said it, so now you know how, now you know how to say it. Once you learn it, you'll never forget it. Just like Balalaika. let me hear you. Sarah Bike is ringing out. Come and keep your comrade warm. I'm back in the USSR. He's embarrassed that I'm singing now. So. <laughs> well, if it makes you feel better, we'll wrap it up. We just are curious if you'd be willing to participate in a 91.8 The Fan tradition. Which is what? We ask everyone if they'd be willing to do a radio bump for us. A radio bump? Sure. Oh, now, we do this live on air, so if you mess up or if your, your son makes you mess up, which is fine, too, everybody gets to hear it. <laughs> But we basically ask if you'd be willing to say, hi, my name is, you insert your name, you can insert roles or characters or what you do, and you're tuned into 91.8 The Fan. Okay, do you want me to just go ahead and do it now? Yep, you can go for take one. Hi, my name's Keith Sarabica. I play Laserbeak in Transformers 3, Dark of the Moon, and uh, you're listening to 91.8 The Fan. Perfect. That was so hard and no bloopers. Almost. <laughs> Almost, but not quite. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. And, and thanks to your son, too, for, for bringing him along for the journey. <laughs> Caleb, do you want to say goodbye? Bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> and for anybody out there that missed any of this interview, don't fret. It'll be up on the website within the next few days. So keep it tuned to 91.8 The Fan. Everything you want and nothing you don't.